here on this map, which I've turned around for about 45 degrees from the, the way we normally view it, um, I've similarly outlined roughly the area that we think of as encompassing the Adelaide Super Basin. I think the reason for turning it around will become clear later. Neoprotrozoic basins in, in Australia um, include a whole lot that uh, occupy the central part of the continent. These were formerly interconnected and we refer to them collectively as the Centralian Superbasin. But by contrast, uh, the notion that the exposed neoprotrozoic sediments of South Australia are in some way associated with an ancient, uh, what we would now call a passive continental margin, really dates back more than 70 years to Reg Sprigg in his um, very important paper of 1952, where he referred to it as the formation of a continental terrace. So in the south, we've got this complex of rift and sag basins and their adjacent cratonic platforms, which we now collectively refer to as the Adelaide Super Basin. And most of us, I think, agree that these record the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia. And interpreting the evolution of this super basin and the ensuing continental margin does require an understanding of their tectonic architecture. And this raises some questions. First of all, what was there before the Adelaide Super Basin? How did that influence its evolution? And what structures were formed both during and during crustal extension prior to and also during continental breakup? So before the Adelaide Super Basin, this, we had the South Australian Craton, Precambrian Craton, which was a continuous craton, not yet subdivided into Gawler Craton, Kernamona province and Musgrave problem, province that we're familiar with today. These only became separate entities as a result of neoprotrozoic and Cambrian tectonic events. The South Australian craton comprised a complex of orogenic belts and volcano sedimentary basins which range in age from Mesoarchaean to late Mesoproterozoic. So the most direct evidence of the basement underneath the Adelaide Super Basin is from the basement outcrops at basin margins and from a few basement inliers. Where the basement is exposed or relatively um, near surface, it has quite distinctive magnetic signatures. But by contrast, in the central depot centers of the super basin, the basement is much too deeply buried and, to, and we don't see any imprint of the basement on the aeromagnetic imagery. So of the basement outcrops, the Kernamona province has the best exposure. So we'll start with that first. The outcropping and shallowly buried Kernamona province is clearly outlined on total magnetic intensity imagery. And we can trace an arcuate, a series of arcuate trends of, uh, of its tectonic grain, which um, reflected in, in, its, in the fold axes of its metasediments. And these trends are clearly truncated at its rifted margins. But the trends are likely to continue in the subsurface to the southwest underneath the Adelaide Super Basin. So, southwest of the Kernamona province, where it outcrops, we have the um, Adelaide Super Basin, which was folded in the Delamerian orogeny. And we can see the fold axial traces, which sort of seem to follow online. Uh, with the um, <clears throat> trends of the basement folds in the. And yet these are more than a billion years younger. The geology of the uh, Kernamona province is quite complicated. 
dominated by the Williama supergroup, which comprises a number of uh, groups shown here, and also uh, Sindhi positional magmatic episodes between 1720 and 1640 million years. These were affected by the Olarian orogeny in the time interval 1620 to 1580 million years and involved a polyphase deformation with refolded maps and overall tectonic transport toward the northwest. The metamorphic grade increases from green schist in the northwest to granulite in the southeast. We have a north south seismic transect, which was done by Geoscience Australia a few years ago, and that provides us with evidence of its deeper crustal structure and intersects a number of southeast dipping thrust, um, thrust faults. And uh, here we see uh, an interpretation. Um, done by uh, a, a group involving the Geoscience Australia and the South Australian Survey. And it shows um, a major uh, thrust at the northern end of the line, which I would interpret as the northern Olarian thrust front. And then we have um, the rocks that are exposed in the Mount Painter in line, the northwest part of the Kernamona province, being sediments that I think were deposited in a foreland basin synchronous with the Olarian orogeny at about 1590 million years. And we also see the Paralanod fault, which is a Delamerian reverse fault, um, probably has an earlier history, but its details are uncertain. Now we come to the southwestern area adjacent to the Adelaide Super Basin. And what does the basement look like there? We've got this area of uh, a magnetic and gravity high that sits under the St. Vincent Basin. This has never been intersected, so we really don't know anything about it. We've got the basement in Lyres in the Mount Lofty Ranges, which consist of high grade metasediments. Uh, we've got an important drill hole, Investigator 1, on Kangaroo Island, which provides some important constraints. Uh, looking at the geology of the southwest region, we see a whole lot of um, Precambrian rocks, including in the lower in the lower section here, 1850 million year old. Paranysis and the Donnington Sweet granites. And these are inferred to be overlain by the Wallaroo group between about 1760 and 1740 million years. And in the to the east of that in the Mount Lofty Ranges, the age of the metasediments constrained between about 1730 and 1650 million years. And finally, we have granites of the Hiltaba Sweet at between 1590 and 1570 million years. So the Wallaroo group sediments over here exposed mainly on York Peninsula. And the deformation and metamorphism of these was associated with the intrusion of the Hiltaba sweet granites. The Barossa complex was metam the metamorphism. Um, they were deformed and metamorphosed at high grade between about 1620 and 1580 million years. And we have one instance of a post-tectonic Hiltaba sweet granite or something that looks very much like it, um, intruding the meta sediments down here near Normanville. So all of these represent an, a westward extension of the orogeny that we see in, in the Kernamona province. We could call that the Olarian origin. Um, Investigator one on Kangaroo Island, totally different. Here we have flat lying, near flat lying Cambrian sediments, directly unconformably overlying Donington Sweet granite. So that is outside of this area of the um, Olarian deformation and 
the Wallaroo group or any of those other um, um, Paleoproterozoic metasediments. And importantly, it's also outside of the zone of rifting during the Neoproterozoic. Now we look at the northwestern marginal region where we have metasediments of the eastern part of the Gaula Craton. Very important boundary is this northeast trending, approximately 1700 million year old Kalanjala shear zone, which forms a boundary between low magnetic rocks to the west and high magnetic rocks to the east. Then there's a change in direction in the northern part, shown here, where the, the boundary changes to a north-northwest orientation. And I would question whether this is really still part of the Kalanjala and would argue that it's actually a younger fault that truncates it. So again, the geology is quite complicated, um, starting off with these with the Kuyadu granite at 3,200 million years, going through uh, a neo archaean to earliest Paleoproterozoic, Sleaford and Mulgathin complex, Donington sweet granites and, and Paranises of 1850. Then the Wallaroo group and um, the Moonaby formation and McGregor volcanics, which appear to be part of the same package. And we have various uh, granite suites. We have the Karana conglomerate, which has some volcanics in it, dated at about 1650. The St. Peter's suite, mafic, various mafic intrusions. And then the Gaula Range volcanics, upper and lower, which are now very well dated. And the Hiltaba suite granites. And finally, we have fluvial sandstones of the Pandora Formation that were deposited in the Karawalu Basin at about 1400. So although this is not part of the Adelaide Super Basin, the Pandara is actually the first sedimentary cover unit of the Gaula Craton. It's not known which of any of these basement units, as well as the Pandara Formation, actually extend eastwards under the Adelaide Super Basin. That's what we don't know. Going back to the Gaula Craton, we have this east-west seismic line. And very importantly, it shows a whole lot of east dipping faults. And one of these, I believe, is that fault that truncates the Kalanjala Milanite zone. Another one <coughs> cuts the Karana conglomerate and is in turn overstepped by the Gaula Range volcanics. So its um, timing of movement is really has to be constrained between 1650 and 1590 and is in all probability of Olarian age, that 1.6 billion year age range of deformation. So it's shown here. And I would regard these as foreland thrusts of the Olarian orogeny at about 1600 million years. Now we look at indirect evidence in the deeply buried depot centers of the super basin. We have evidence from seismic. We've got another seismic section being processed at the moment, and that's going to be very interesting to see, but we haven't seen that yet. But this one was done across the Flinders Ranges some years ago. And again, we have an interpretation done by um, Geoscience Australia and the South Australian Survey. And it shows a number of east dipping faults which penetrate deep into the basin, basement. And these can be interpreted as perhaps Olarian thrusts with Neoproterozoic extensional and then Delamerian contractional re <coughs> reactivation. Within the super basin itself, we don't see a lot of evidence for basement except for a, a block of granite in the Blinman diapere, 
which resembles the Mulawatna sweet granites of Mount Painter and may represent a southwesterly extension of the Mount Painter geology. And the other thing we have is southeast of there, near Tarawi in the mid north, we have a Jurassic timberlite which has brought up deep crustal xenoliths. So what we see is um, an arcuate belt of deformation during the interval 1620 to 1580 million years, which we could call the greater Olarian origin. And it had overall Northwest directed tectonic transport. So this orogenesis affected a whole series of eastward <clears throat> Younging volcano sedimentary basins, including the Wallaroo Group and um, <clears throat> and the Williama Supergroup. So, in the foreland of of this origin, we have the unmetamorphosed uh, Karana conglomerate, which is just folded and has a thrust fault going through it. Uh, possibly the volcanoclastic Moonaby formation. Then we have, in a more metamorphosed zone to the east of that, we have the Wallaroo Group and the northwestern part of the Williama Supergroup, which are medium grade metamorphic rocks. <laughs> and then in the high grade zone, which includes the Barossa complex and the southeastern part of the Kernamona province is the Williama supergroup, and that includes Broken Hill. So we've got these various belts of different ages affected by the Olarian orogeny. The eastern, so the, the easternmost belts were affected by this uh, northwest verging 1620 to 1580 million year origin. And the crust, deep crustal xenoliths from the Kimberlite, which is midway between Kernamona and the Barossa complex, have been dated at 1600 million years. And so this suggests that they were part of a continuous origin between those regions. And much of this greater, <coughs> much of the area of the Adelaide Superbasin coincides with the greater Olarian origin. And the arcuate trends of this origin may have partly controlled the arcuate sedimentary trends seen in the Adelaide Superbasin and also in the subsequent Delamerian <coughs> Nacro Fold Arc. Many other continental margin successions around the world and orogenic belts are similarly built on the remains of earlier origins. Now we'll talk about tectonic controls on sedimentation. First of all, I want to show the G2 corridor, which was very popular some years ago. It's one of a number of structural corridors that were identified by Tim O'Driscoll from geophysics when he was working for Western Mining. And this was before we had these beautiful geophysical images. He listed um, mineral deposits that lie adjacent or within this corridor, including Olympic Dam. Um, but we really don't have any sort of understanding, and he certainly didn't provide it, of what, what the fundamental characteristics of these corridors is. But we can say that it's clearly associated with the Neoproterozoic Rift Tectonics, because in the south, it coincides with the eastern limit, of the relatively shallow basement, as we can see on magnetics and gravity. And in the north, it also coincides with the outcrop of the rocks and the Peak and Denison ranges. So these are considered to represent the earliest eastern rifted margin of the Gola Crater. And the gravity also shows some <clears throat> major gravity lows, which may indicate deep low density sedimentary depot centers. So let's have a look now at the rift history that affected this region. 
we start off very clearly with northwest south northeast southwest extension as expressed in the Gairdner dikes on the Gola Craton. And we find that um, major extensional basins are also developed in a northwest southeast orientation. And individual faults that we see, the normal faults that were active during deposition, also have this northwesterly trend. And um, <clears throat> equivalents of the Gairdner uh, dolerite dikes are found in the Kernamona province. And that includes the little Broken Hill Gabbro near Broken Hill, which has been dated and is part of the same event. And of course, we have widespread mafic lavas that include the Voltana volcanics and the Beta basalt. And the rifts that developed are offset on transform faults that developed at high angles to the rift axes. But notably, down in the south, the Adelaide region <coughs> remains on the rift shoulder. So all the rifting that occurred was to the east of it at this stage. Uh, here we have an example of an area that I mapped in the Pernamona province, which shows very clearly a northwest trending dike cutting basement granite, which um, we think we have not dated, but we think is related to the Gairdner dikes. The second major extensional episode is the, represented by the Kurdi Merka subgroup of the Kalana group. And this shows continuing northeast southwest extension that produced uh, deeply subsiding evaporitic rift basins. In the Adelaide region, uh, this area would still remain up high and was not affected by the rifting, although right at its eastern margin, we have this granite intruded at Mount Crawford and probably intruded into an extensional shear zone in the Barossa complex. And that's been dated at 812 million years. And it's pretty much on trend of the G2 corridor. The Kurti Merka subgroup is a very thick succession of mixed siliciclastic carbonate and evaporitic sediments with minor volcanics persisting. It's preserved in sequence only in a few places, such as in the Willowan Ranges south of Maree, and also the Peak and Denison Ranges northwest of William Creek, and in the Spalding Inlier, just north of Clare. Elsewhere, the Curdy Merka found, subgroup is found in a disrupted state, and disrupted to varying extents in the Flinders Ranges diapirs. So the distribution of the diapirs, shown here as the little dark green areas, really outline quite well the aerial distribution of the Kurdi Merka subgroup. And we can say we know that it, the Kurdi Merka subgroup is absent to the east and west of this zone, where the Burra group and younger sediments directly overlie either the Akarula subgroup or the basement. So we know that there was never any Kurdi Merka subgroup deposited there. The extent of the Kurdi Merka subgroup towards the southeast is open. We have no idea how far that may have extended because, <clears throat> well, firstly, there are no diapirs southeast of there. And secondly, um, the exposed stratigraphy does not go deep enough. We're looking at dominantly younger units. The third major extensional phase is represented by the Emeru subgroup of the Burra group. And this shows continuing northeast southwest extension, but a widening of the extensional basin complex in the south. And we see development of Horst and Graben structures in the mid north region, north of Adelaide. The Adelaide and also Aleri regions now become subsidence for the first time. And in these areas, fluvial sediments on that basement for the first time. And there are local mafic and bimodal volcanics. 
during the deposition of the borough group, this is a part of a map of the an area near Clare in the mid north, where the details of some of the faulting here look uh, because these are steeply dipping beds. We're actually looking at a depositional cross section rather than just a map. And um, we see what looks very much like extensional geometry on those faults. There is a fourth major extensional episode in the Neoproterozoic, and that was associated with the Sturtian glaciation and the Yadnamatna subgroup of the Ambaratna group. And this developed um, extensional troughs, but further east than the earlier ones. And so we see these developing. Uh, on both sides, both the southwest and northeast of the Kernamona province, and also a trough in the northern Flinders, the Yadnamatna trough. So these represent renewed northeast southwest extension during the Sturtian glaciation. And new, these new um, extensional basins were formed on both sides of Kernamona province. Thereafter, we have post-glacial transgression at about 650 million years, which marked, is marked by the first marine flooding of the Stewart Shelf, the Gola Craton, to the west. And subsequent Neoproterozoic sag phase is mostly a sag phase sedimentation with only minor rifting occurring. Um, this is um, a diagram to illustrate how interpret the, um, the structure of a number of um, basement inliers in the O'Leary region, the southwest margin of the Kernamona province. The precursors of these present day inliers was interpreted as tilted fault, brot, fault blocks and half gravens. We do have some evidence of northwest Southeast trending faults continuing to be active at the later stages and with minor rifting occurring. So, this is an example in the mid north, um, just southeast of Tarawi, where we have um, northwest trending faults with changes in thickness across them. The, the formations are thick, um, thicken across these faults. So they are interpreted as minor growth faults. And they have moved again during the Delamerian orogeny. And we have this mega kink developed in a syncline um, around these faults. We also have a lot of um, minor northeast, northwest, southeast trending faults and offsets and kinks developed in the region. Uh, some of these may be controlled by original rift faults. Something completely different happened in the Cambrian with a new extensional episode that postdates the formation of the passive margin. And this is the development of the Cambrian II trough. This is widely believed to have occurred by back arc extension, and it cuts right across the earlier rift axes at a high angle. The, the normal faults were deeply rooted in the basement and were the precursors of many of the Delamerian thrust faults that we see in the Mount Lofty Ranges. So to conclude, despite the broadly meridional orientation of the super basin, most of the individual controlling normal faults trend northwest southeast or north northwest south south southeast. Neoproterozoic rifting took place in four major episodes of northeast southwest extension. The zone of rifting widens to the southeast toward the evolving continental margin and wedges out towards the northwest. The rifts were offset on transfer faults at high angles to the rift axes. And northeast trending faults southeast of the Kernamona province and also similar fault uh, southeast of the Georgina Basin became transformed faults in the Rodinia breakup. 
So continental separation was achieved on northwest trending rifted segments and northeast trending transformed segments. And the Euler pole of rotation of the rifting blocks may have been situated somewhere in the northwestern part of Australia. Then finally, early Cambrian back arc extension rifted the previously established passive margin and part of the southeastern polar crater. And I'll leave it there. <laughs>